Chapter 14 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape. Chapter 14 Land Beyond the Stars. At first, Retok the Abarian was too stunned by what he witnessed to think coherently. With the other Tarthians of royal blood, he had received an unexpected summons to appear at the royal dock on the River of Ice, and before he could even try to fathom what it was about, an escort of Nadian guards had come to fetch him. It was cold and murky on the banks of the River of Ice. The two men, Retok and Hultax, had arrived barely in time to see them unfastening the hawsers of the royal barge. Curious, he pushed closer through the crowd of nobles. Suddenly, before the barge was quite unmoored, as it swayed and rocked on the currents of the river, Nadian soldiers appeared with a platform on poles slung across their shoulders, the usual means of intra-city transportation for Nadian royalty. But this was no royalty Retok saw on the platform, although they were dressed as royalty. The woman, conscious and bound hand and foot, was the virgin of the wayfarers who had witnessed Prince Jlomek's death. The man, unconscious, his head propped high on pillows, was the white giant who once on the plains of Ophrid had almost strangled Retok. A hatred such as he had never known flashed through Retok's brain. He was so close he could see the gentle up-and-down motion of the giant's chest as he breathed. Then beyond the platform he saw Volna. Volna smiled at him. The platform bobbed by, was placed on the barge at the foot of Jlomek's beer. The remaining hawsers were cut loose. There was, Retok thought triumphantly, no return from the place of the dead. But still the white giant had recovered from what looked like certain death once, had vanished abruptly and fantastically when he would have died again. What was good enough for Volna the Beautiful was not necessarily good enough for Retok of Abaria. He watched only long enough to see the royal barge pushed out into the icy currents of the river, then he turned and made his way to the second tier of observers, where Hultax stood among the lesser nobility and the military officers of the planet Tarth. He found Hultax and whispered for a time in his ear. Hultax's face blanched. But, Lord, he protested, there is no return. It is obvious the man will die. You couldn't expect me to—' Hultax, frightened, confused, could neither think clearly nor express himself properly. His mouth hung open. "'Earlier, Hultax,' Retox said with a hard smile, "'you craved action. I give you action. Take a boat.' There are some moored down river for the use of Nadian priests on their religious pilgrimages to the banks where the stilt birds dwell. Overtake the royal barge. Board it. Slay the man and the woman. But I. the place of the dead. Fool! hissed Retok. I didn't ask you to visit the place of the dead. That's up to you. If you slay them first on the river of ice and can bring back proof, but the longer we talk, the further they go. You'll go?" It was phrased as a question. Actually, it was a command. Grim-faced, the whip-sword trailing at his side, Hultax left the crowd of soldiers and made his way downstream. A few moments later he had pulled a wooden skiff out into the icy current and went down river in pursuit of the royal barge. The guards had unbound Ilya's fetters on the barge, knowing she could never swim for safety in the waters of the River of Ice. She sat now at the foot of Jlomek's beer, with Bram Forrest's handsome head cushioned on her lap. It was very cold there on the river. Wind blew, rustling the reeds which grew along the bank. They had long since emerged from the river's underground cavern. The swift current carried them now through a country of ice, a tundra. The reeds, twice as tall as a man, seemed to thrive on the river banks. They swallowed everything. Bram Forrest opened his eyes and looked at her, and smiled. He tried to sit up, wincing as pain knifed through his head. "'We seem to make a habit of this,' he said, smiling again. 
Shh! You mustn't talk. She leaned close. He could smell the animal perfume of her body, like musk and jasmine. Impulsively, she kissed him softly on the lips. His arm went around her neck. He pulled her head down and drank deeply of her. Why, she began all breathless, because I love you. I think I loved you the first moment I saw you. But I didn't know it then. He laughed softly, gently, and she did not know why this should be so. Why do you laugh? I was an infant, the son of the queen, of Queen Evala. Portox the scientist fled with me, the last of the royal Ophridian blood, to the other side of the solar system, to a world the twin of this, a world we never see because the sun always stands between us, a world called Earth. There I would wait until maturity. There I would be given the strength and the wisdom I needed. And then I would return to Tarth and right the ancient wrong. Well, I have returned. I love you. It is enough, Ilya. I want to think of the future, not the past." Ilya let him kiss her again. Isn't it the same, the future and the past? Aren't they one? I too am of Ophridian blood, Bram Forrest, of the lesser nobility. There are hundreds of us, living nomadic lives on the Ophridian plains, where once our great nation stood. I didn't know that. It wasn't in Portox's training. Now Portox is dead. I buried him on this world called Earth. He could not even come back to his native Tarth. Darling, don't you see? That's exactly why the ancient wrong must be righted, why Retok must pay for his infamous deeds. So Portox and the millions of other Ophridians, slain, all slain, can sleep eternally in peace. You are their champion. But revenge? What is revenge if you are the champion of the future, too? Don't you see? Oh, don't you? Of all the unborn tomorrows when the Ophridian nation may live again, of all the unborn tomorrows when the nations of Tarth can live together in peace and harmony, don't you understand that? It's funny. I try to see my mother's face, Queen Avala, but all I see is you. She's the past, Ilya. You're the future." He held her lightly. There is no future for anyone as long as Retok the Abarian rules, and dreams of Tarth, all Tarth, as his domain. Bram Forrest stood up. The cold winds blew. He looked at the blue-cold body of Jlomek, lying in state, at the ice-choked river, at the banks of rustling reeds. He did not have to ask where they were. He knew. Perhaps, he said at last, I only mean that if I do this thing, it will be more to see that future generations live in peace than to bring vengeance on a power-mad abarian. Oh, Bram, that's what I wanted you to say. I wanted to hear you say that. For tomorrow, for all our tomorrows. Bram Forrest walked to the rail of the barge and gripped it, and looked out over the ice floes. He recited, An ape, a boar, a stallion, a land beyond the stars, a virgin's feast, a raging beast, a prison without bars. Why, what an unusual poem! Ilya cried. Then, hold me close, it's so cold, and I'm afraid, Bram Forrest, of the place of the dead? Yes, yes, the place of the dead. It and the poem are entwined, Bram Forrest said musingly. I know they are. Together they're my destiny. And the destiny of all Tarth? Perhaps. Portox like to think so, I guess. I like to think so, Bram Forrest. She smiled up at him tremulously. And my destiny as well. Ilya, he asked abruptly, what do you know about the golden ape? You mentioned it to me once, when you thought I, well, when you thought I endangered your virginity. Why, nothing beyond what the legends say. 
And what do the legends say? It is written in the most ancient of our religious beliefs that the messenger to the place of the dead is a golden ape. Naturally, in these same beliefs, a defiled virgin is supposed to kill herself. Thus, in a way of speaking, she goes to the golden ape, you see? Bram Forrest smiled down at her. What would you think if I told you the golden ape was real? If I told you that there actually was a place of the dead? For the spirits of the departed? Ilya asked in a very small voice. No. Man can't presume to know about that. It's in the realm of the gods. I mean a place which somehow borders on Tarth, and yet, yet is beyond the stars. A place which, when wayfarers returned from it miraculously long and long ago, gave rise to the legends. Borders on Tarth, yet beyond the stars? How can this be? Portox found it and explained it with his science, Bram Forrest insisted. Earth and Tarth, twin worlds, yet so different, forever unseen one by the other on opposite sides of the sun. They're unique in the solar system, Ilya. Portox thought, if the memory he had planted in my mind is correct, that they're unique in the entire universe. Somehow, a million million years ago, a world split, becoming two worlds. But ordinary space, I don't know, the memory is confused, could not hold them. There is a warp of space, a place where space bends. Learn to master the warp, and you go instantly from Tarth to Earth or back again. That was the way Portox brought me as an infant to Earth. He held aloft his arm, showing her the steel-silver disk. With this, I can travel back and forth at will. Without it, either Earth or Tarth would be my prison. His voice trailed off. Then he blurted, A prison without bars! What? The prophetic poem. Part of the poem. Anyway, Ilya, Earth and Tarth exist at either end of this space warp, connected thus through normal space where there should be no connection. And some place along the warp, where ordinary space-time distances don't matter... I'm sorry, Bram Forrest, I don't understand you. I'm not sure I understand myself. Tarth is a primitive world. It is beyond our science. It is even beyond the science of Earth, I believe, and Earth is a millennium ahead of Tarth in its development. But Portox knew. Anyhow, some place along the warp, in ordinary distances along the space-time continuum, perhaps a billion light-years distant from either Earth or Tarth, is a third world. On the warp it is very close. The river of ice leads to it. We call it the Place of the Dead. But the Golden Ape inhabits the so-called place of the dead. Their world was dying, but Portox saved them. I think, the science is beyond me, the entropy of their galaxy was running down, their world perishing, freezing, when somehow, with his great science, Portox claimed for their use the unavailable energy in their... their thermodynamic system and saved them. Why do you frown so? Words, words only. I don't understand. I can only act. You can act, Ilya said, hugging herself tight against him, for Tarth and the future. For Tarth and the future, Bram Forrest said, but he hardly heard the words. Ahead of them, in the cold, clear air, a wall seemed to rise. It came up so suddenly, and in fact the air had cleared so suddenly from the accustomed murkiness that Ilya was afraid. "'It is in the legend,' she whispered. "'The black wall, Bram Forrest, and beyond it, the place of the dead.' More accurately, an edge-on view of the space warp, where it meets the normal world." But although he spoke the words of Portox, Bram Forrest did not sound too confident. "'We're coming closer to it, Bram. Hold me!' He held her. There was nothing else he could do. 
The current swept the barge on inexorably. The black wall reared ahead of them, frowned down at them, seemed to block off all the rest of the universe and all reality, whether of Earth or of Tarth. The barge penetrated the wall. Black and solid-seeming, solid as stone, it yet offered no resistance. The barge disappeared within it. Behind the barge, rope trailing so close that its prow almost scraped the royal wood, was a skiff in which, shaking and afraid, yet somehow triumphant because he had heard Bram Forrest's strange words, was Hultax the Abarian. End of chapter 14